here's our little map we're going to revisit to show you the route we took down through all that plain and we're heading to the mud volcano area of course today we're going to head out of the park to jackson hole wyoming well that's sulfur cauldron which is not only noisy but it's very smelly it smells like rotten eggs it says it's the most acidic feature in the park or one of them you remember that big volcanic eruption that happened 640,000 years ago? The super eruption that filled up the whole caldera with lava? Well, right here at this mud volcano area is where one of the major vents was from which that lava flowed. And it's still really active. As a matter of fact, this big hill here is really uplift caused by magma underneath. The sign that's here says that if there's another eruption at Yellowstone Supervolcano, it's going to start right here. So we're standing on ground zero. You're asking about. Goodbye, everybody. Sign R. Catch on the flip side. Adios, muchachos. This shows you how active this area is, right in the parking lot. It's a hot spot that burned right through the asphalt, even recently, too. Yep, sure it is. Yeah, the asphalt is the old parking lot. Yep. Yep, that's what happens. That. Like a sinkhole. Yeah, the mud volcano area is very interesting, and it's got a lot of boardwalk but still it's only about a mile. The mud volcano is near the spot of the greatest uplift in sinking the volcano floor. In 1978, there was a series of small earthquakes and it left this. This is called the cooking hillside because the temperature of the soil got to be about 200 degrees and killed the roots of the trees. So here's a good place to put in yet another warning about Yellowstone National Park. Toxic gases exist in Yellowstone. Dangerous levels of hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide have been measured in some hydrothermal areas. If you feel sick, leave the location immediately. See one like this either. Wow. Those are mostly gases. Maybe it's poisonous. It might have hydrogen sulfide in it. There's always change at Yellowstone, like they like to remind us constantly. Early explorers to Yellowstone describe this feature. A most repulsive and terrifying sight, a volcano-like cone 30 feet high and 30 feet wide with mud erupting to cover tall trees. In 1872, Nathaniel Langford said he saw a seething, bubbling mass of mud. It's likely a violent eruption blew out the side, and so it's not nearly so dramatic today.
Well, the next stop on the road is going to be Yellowstone Lake. We're going to stop at the fishing bridge and then we're going to explore the lake shore. And here is the fishing bridge on the Yellowstone River, which drains the entire Lake Yellowstone. Well, you can't actually fish on the bridge, but you could up until the 70s. But the name stuck anyway. And here's the beautiful hotel at Yellowstone Lake. Now Yellowstone Lake is 132 square miles or 20 miles by 14 miles. It's the highest, largest lake in North America, around 7,700 feet above sea level. It's frozen for half the year and it thaws out in May or June. There's been some recent exploration of the lake bottom and they say it looks just like the above ground features with underwater geysers and underwater hot springs and underwater fumaroles. They say that these areas are like the vents in the middle of the oceans and they support an ecosystem of bacteria and sponges and earthworms. Well, here is the western shore, which is the part we explored. But the whole lake itself is tilting towards the south. That's why on the northern shore, you're going to find sandy beaches, but a lot of erosion on the southern shore. Though there's ever so much more to see, we finally have to leave Yellowstone and head on south. You can see by this little map here that we're going to head out through the south entrance and end up tonight at Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Time. National Park. And here you can see on this little map that there's a little more of the National Park called the Grand Teton. And this is the northern tip of Jackson Lake, which was very low, as you can see. The main feature of Teton National Park is the scenery. Some of those peaks are over 10,000 feet tall. We took a short detour from the road but it turns out it's five miles to the top of Signal Mountain, which you can get a view of the entire Teton Range and Jackson Lake. We're about a thousand feet above the valley. Here I wanted to show you these potholes there. Those are caused by glacial ice boulders. Well, at this moment is officially the end of our Yellowstone Park journey, but we still have a couple of more days. Okay, next up, Jackson Hole. Here's the Elk Reserve just north of Jackson. Now, this is the area we just left around Jackson Lake, Signal Mountain. And we're going to come up on Jackson which is a town in the valley of Jackson Hole, and there's the National Elk Refuge.
Jackson Hole, Wyoming, on a chilly morning, Thursday. Well, here we are just walking around Jackson. And by the way, is it Jackson or Jackson's Hole? Well, Jackson refers to the town. But Jackson Hole refers to the whole valley, which is about 60 miles long. The town was named in 1894. It has a population now of around 8,600. The skiing came about in the 1930s. Yet, even though there's a small population, there's a $30 million Jackson Hole Center for the Arts in Jackson. It's 60 miles south of Yellowstone, and get this, the median price of a house is $1.1 million. That may be because only 3% of the county is developable. The rest is owned by the government. And speaking of the government, Dick Cheney has a house around here too somewhere. But he never did invite us. Well, in Jackson, we stayed at the Antler Inn, which is an older motel. And I'm showing it off here. The interesting thing about this is, this motel was never really updated, but it's maintained just as good as it can possibly be. That's a very interesting combination. Well, leaving Jackson, we decided to go see Fossil Butte National Monument, and that's in Wyoming. But here's some of the scenes along the way. We're going to trace our route down to Fossil Butte National Monument in Wyoming. We cross into Idaho just a little bit, then we go back into Wyoming, and here we go. Right to here is our next destination. Here's another road construction in progress. Well, this spot is important because of the fossils. 50 million years ago were three great lakes. All of this plant and animal life is preserved in these beautiful fossils that fell to the lake bottom. Sadly, we're nearing the end of our vacation and we're now we're heading for Salt Lake City. And here's our route. Last full day of our vacation, we got up bright and early to head west out of town to see the Great Salt Lake and the Bonneville Salt Flat. I've been very interested in those my whole life, so I was really looking forward to this. And here you can see our route as we head west. We're skirting the south shore of the Great Salt Lake 
and heading across the Great Salt Desert to Wendover, Utah, about 100 miles away. We saw a lot of things out in the desert. Here's a big mound of salt. We even saw a Morton salt plant. The Bonneville Salt Flats, the Great Salt Lake, and the Great Salt Desert are actually remnants of Lake Bonneville, which existed around 33,000 years ago. It was 1,000 feet deep and 300 miles long. And here we see our destination, Bonneville, Wendover, Utah. Salt flats. Looks like the water, but it's not. Look at this. Cool. We are going to walk out onto the actual salt flats. Here we are. This is not snow this time, it's salt. Well, this is the little causeway you go out to get to the Bonneville Salt Flats. That is to say, the raceway. This land is administered by the Bureau of Land Management, and they've been raising out here since 1912. The depth of salt is about six feet thick in some spots. There's around 30,000 acres, and it's so flat and so wide that it follows the curvature of the earth. to do something big. Something bigger and better than all the other jokers. This is it, Bonneville. Now this is the place where big things happen. Do you realize, Rusty, the fastest man has ever gone on land this year? Right here where we are now. Huh. Malcolm Campbell did he hear with uh, Blue Bird. First guy to go over 300 mile an hour and then later his son Donald Campbell was here with Proudius. He crashed at 350 mile an hour and lifted to tell the tale. <laughs> John Cobb was here. First guy to go over 400 mile an hour. All the great attempts. George Easton with Thunderbolt and uh, Mickey Thompson with uh, Challenger. I'm telling you, Rusty, this place is holy ground, mate. Holy ground. And I made it here. center of pressure behind the center of gravity and if you don't get it right then she'll start to fishtail as soon as you get it wound up. Uh, what do you mean by fishtail? Well, like a fish is behind, you know, it'll start doing that and that's what happened today when I had the handling run and so in a panic I uh, lifted my head up from behind the uh, screen and uh, suddenly the bike started to go straight and I knew somehow that I'd solved the problem by sticking my head up into the wind. I don't get it. Me neither. Okay, that was in reference to the world's fastest Indian. Well, a lot happened out there. For one thing, it got really soft 
and we lost our way, but we made it back. One of the things we noticed about being out there is this. Here's our car. That salt sticks to the car like nothing you ever saw. That is not snow, but salt. Salt in the body of salt. I'm ready whenever you are. Here we are, back at the Salt Flats. Guess the races weren't on after all today. We're here to set the land speed record in the Chevy Impala rental car. Fortunately, you got to go in a straight line instead of circles, but we got to warm up the tires for the big race. One thing we learned today was that, number one, donuts aren't near as much fun as a front-wheel drive car. Number two, the races weren't actually on anymore. And number three, don't ever buy a used rental car. I'll put that on YouTube. Yeah, that go good. <laughs> Craig Breedlove at the Bonneville Salt Flats. Now I get to walk out. I want to walk on here. I'm going to walk over to that cone. See that cone? There's a cone. Looks like we're walking on the water, but we're walking. There's cones. This might have been the cores. We were on the cores. Um, like between that right down here. There we go. Okay. We wandered on out here, and if they would have actually been here like they're supposed to have been here, we would have been right there in the head of them. Just shoot right by and might even have flown over us. But here we go, right here. They forgot a cone. Southern California Timing Association. That's who does the Bonneville Salt Flats. Now that would be one hell of a souvenir, I'll tell you what. But, I mean, they just left it. They didn't want it anymore. <laughs> but we can't. I could figure out a way to get that in my bag. It's not like it's stealing, because see, it's all around here and got left. And somebody else is going to come pick this up, you know, Southern California Timing Association. I can squish it. Okay. Well, I could get that in my bag. Look at that. There, straight ahead. There's the. It got left. It's not like it's stealing because it got left. Till next year, somebody's gonna come on. Well, we're heading on back. We didn't actually break the land speed record for the stock Chevy and Pal SS rental car. But we had a good time anyway. We got close. Like I say, at least we didn't break the car. We had a good time out here. The salt was dry. We might as well go for one last time. Like I say, revenge is sweet. Okay, here we're looking for that motel that was featured in the world's fastest Indian. I'm not sure this is it, but it did kind of look like it. Hey, Bert. Hello. The front forks could go at any time. The suspension is right out of the 1920s. He's got hairline cracks all over his tires. He's got no fire extinguisher, no safety chute. I told you, if it's a time problem, the old guy's welcome to some of my time. It's not a time problem, it's a bike problem. Well, I think we ought to let him run. He came all the way from New Zealand to do this. Jim, have you had a good look at his machine? All I know is the man's the genuine article. Yeah, well, the bike is a genuine dinosaur. Maybe not, but it sure looks like it. Yeah, that's what I 
with the pool right there and everything. We'll just say this is it. This sure looks like it. There's old Bert's room. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we promised the car a really good bath, and here it is. Documented proof that we actually did it. The abandoned Wendover Air Base. Of course, it's not that abandoned because there's lots of cars out here. Well, this is actually a work in progress because it's the most original remaining World War II Army Air Corps base in the country. Wow, this is where the annulment gag. This is where the Enola Gag was. This is where the Enola Gag sat in this hangar. Yep, and here is the Enola Gay with Colonel Paul Tibbetts when he came back from that bombing mission. The actual hangar on the wall. The original bombing mission. And here's the Enola Gay landing on Tinian after completion of the mission. And this disturbing picture is the actual photo of the Nagasaki bomb. Well, the Bonneville Salt Flats are so neat that we decided to stop by one last time on the way back to Salt Lake City. This time we were not going to get salt on the car. It seems that each winter a shallow layer of water floods this whole area. Then in spring and summer it evaporates and winds make the surface smooth by blowing across it. And that's how it's so flat. Well, I guess that wraps it up for Speed Week. Maybe next year we'll be on time. This is the part where we ride off into the sunset. So anyway, you should all come out and check it out and bring your streamliner with you. Because there's only one place on earth like the Bonneville Salt Flats. Dale wanted a souvenir of the salt, so he's out there scooping up salt into a Walmart bag. Well, we have to reluctantly head back the way we came. So here we're going on the south shore of the lake again. But we decided to make a detour to the Kennecott Mine. And here we're going to get off the interstate and go down into the Quira Mountains, where we're going to see the largest open pit mine in the world. We are in Bingham Canyon at the Kennecott Mine, which is an open pit mine. It's huge. It's just really hard to get the scale here. It's two and a half miles across and three quarters of a mile deep. In fact, it's so big it can be seen from space. It's interesting to remember that instead of being a big hole, this used to be a mountain. It opened in 1904. Tell me gets hurt here. <laughs> We're way up top of the visitor center where they have a little exhibit that shows the history and the types of mining they do, which is mainly for copper. It's a lot of copper, in fact, 15% of the country's copper, or 300,000 tons. They also get gold, about 25,000 pounds a year, and they also get silver, about 250,000 pounds per year. In 
Here are two of these giant dump trucks, which you can see here a regular pickup behind one of them. They're $3 million a piece, and they can carry 255 tons at a time. There are 64 of them, and they run about 15 miles an hour all around the canyon. They have one of the giant tires here at the visitor center. And by the way, this visitor center opened in 2006. They can continue mining like this until the year 2013. But after that, they're going to have to make changes. Here you can see one of the very large dump trucks being loaded. The dump trucks take it up to a conveyor area where it goes five miles to a concentrator. This is the path to that overlook where we just were at the visitor center. This is one of the graphics in the visitor center and it shows the path from the conveyor five miles away to the concentrator there and then from there it goes 13 more miles to another refiner, the smelter. And that's where it turns into the final product. And there it is, just across the interstate from our next stop, the Great Salt Lake. Okay, we're about to make the very last stop of our entire vacation, but not the least, the Great Salt Lake. I've been wanting to see this my whole life, and there it is. Now I'm gonna get to walk out on it in just a minute. It's just beautiful. As you can see, it's a little overcast, and it's late in the day. But just look at that, it's beautiful. The lake is low right now, because they're having a drought. Now this is something we, sh we regret not doing, is going out on this boat, which was just leaving, about the time we were getting to this marina. And there it is. <laughs> Here's some interesting things about the Great Salt Lake. It's around 13% salt. Compare that to 5% for seawater. And you can get the idea, it's very salty. It's the largest salt lake in the Western Hemisphere and the 33rd largest of all the lakes on Earth. It's around 1,700 square miles and it's a remnant of Lake Bonneville. That's that ancient lake that existed around 32,000 to 14,000 years ago. The only thing that lives in this lake are the brine shrimp, and there's a lot of those. In fact, when they die, their carcasses wash up and it creates this really strong smell. Here's Deborah. She's walking along the Great Salt Lake. She's looking for salt fish. Salt. Very salt. There's bugs. There's seagulls, so there must be something for them to eat. Fading out. She says that's good. Coming back. Now those brine shrimp are really tiny. They're almost microscopic, but they measure them by the ton, so you can imagine how many live out here. You just have this feeling you're walking along the edge of the shore at the beach, but you look down and there's not a single shell. There's just nothing, except for a whole bunch of these, like, carcasses of these these brine flies and brine shrimps. I 
put this in because I wanted to show how clear the water was. Here I am walking through the sand, but it says that these sand grains are actually oolites, which are concentric layers of a calcium carbonate around a brine shrimp fecal pellet. Mm. Salicornia. Here's a close up of those brine fly carcasses that creates that smell. It's amazing these plants can live in such a salty area. But here's proof about how tenacious life is. And this is where we had spent all this time at the Great Salt Lake State Marine on the South Shore. You notice there's not any power boats out there. I don't know why. Well, it's time to leave the airport. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. Bye! Mm -hmm.